Woo hoo! Marie! Woo hoo! Chupacabra! Chupacabra part two! Because, well, not really part two, but take two. Because in take one, we had a snafu. And the rest of this will be spoken word. <laughs> the whole episode will be spoken word. We're cake now. We're that band cake. <laughs> yep. That's who we are. How's it going, Marie? I kind of think we should do an entire episode in spoken no, word poetry. No, no. I mean, okay, so wait. It's already awesome. spoken word. What? Wait, hold on. Spoken word poetry. When they when they talk like this, and they're talking in poetry. Yeah, haven't you ever seen or been on? No. I think I it would, was probably. Never mind. I would punch myself in the face, Marie. <laughs> I think I would. So, uh, dear it's listeners. Dear, dear listeners, thanks for joining us again here on uh, Chupacabra, this time for real. Chupacabra. Cabra, the Shoot. revenge. This time it's personal. Yes, yes. This time it is very personal. Uh, El Perro del, del Sarna, or El Perro de Sarna, the dog of mange. God damn, my phone just went off. <laughs> Jesus fuck. Oh my god. It's been, it's been a shit show, Marie. <laughs> All right, let's. I Jake, roll the tape. Personally, think we could be cursed by the chupacabra. We, we might be cursed. We might I'm be cursed. Saying, We're just cursed. You know what it is. So, listeners, for those that don't know, mm-hmm. the previous episode yeah, of the let's chupacabra. Let's get into it. Let's unpack this. Let's unpack it. Let's the, unpack it, y'all. In the in the you know we like here to be very transparent. If it's from you know not editing out the sound of me hitting the microphone. To, you know, us having to take back episodes all the time because of, you know, snafus and things. Once. Once. One time. That's true. One time. One time. One time. The uh, the challenge here with this episode with the Chupacabra was essentially that the, um, I, I mean, I, 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 the definitive source on this subject or one of the main sources on the subject mm-hmm. is not a great, does not have a great track record when it comes to women. Uh-huh. And so there was a very uncomfortable, protracted kind of battle within the skeptical community around this individual who we're not even going to name anymore because we just don't feel comfortable promoting in any way. Um, you know, if you want to learn more, you can, of course. But essentially, when um, when we first recorded the show, we knew about the controversy somewhat. But we didn't really know how deep it went. And then after listeners started reaching out and saying, hey, you should look into this a little bit more. It's a little bit more serious than you think it is. Um, we looked mm-hmm. into it and it is a little bit more serious than we thought it was. And yes. so we just want, you know, we just wanted to re-record this and uh, not promote people we don't think are are promote promotion worthy, frankly. Yes. They don't get our stamp of approval. No, 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 they don't. <laughs> no, no. No, no. So, so, and this, this, I, to me, this raised a lot of interesting questions, just sort of in general about like, if I may go on just a quick tangent, I know we're going to talk about the chupacabra, but just a quick tangent, like, can you, uh, can you separate the art from the artist? Yeah. Right? And that's come up a lot, especially within the last couple of years, like, I myself used to be a very big Woody Allen fan. Uh, Annie Hall, one of my favorite movies, something that like we watched every year. It was, you know, this this favorite between my husband and I. And now I just I I personally can't watch it because I can still see it as a very great film, but it now just is ha- it has all this baggage, right? Well, it has all this sort of like junk that goes with it that just to me doesn't make doesn't make it an enjoyable thing anymore which is sort of it's unfortunate but it's also the truth so you have to kind of face that truth yeah it's it's one of those it's one of those situations that we've hit a lot of in recent times especially with the me too mm-hmm. movement and especially with i mean just in general as well investigative reporting i think getting yeah better you know and and, all, yeah. and not even just say investigative reporting cuz that's not really i don't think really true necessarily i think what is true is that uh Journalists, you know, journalism kind of solidified into this obelisk of you work for these big companies, 
and they were all controlled by these three mega corporations. And, you know, so you towed the party line, you know, Mm -hmm. and a lot of the time the news companies would be owned by entertainment divisions as well. And so you'd have these big companies like, you know, um, like 20th Century Fox or like, you know, um, I'm trying to think of, you know, other ones. uh, What's the one that owns like Comedy Central and HGTV and there's there's a whole whole bunch of them, right? Viacom or uh, I think it's Viacom. But anyways, there are these big companies that, you know, so it. It became really difficult for or really easy, I should say, for stories of a salacious nature about really big money makers for these companies to get thrown under the rug. Yes. And so I think that honestly, it's probably one of the only good things the Internet has done, at least for our society. You know, I think it's done a lot of great things for other societies. But one of the few good things it's done for ours is opening up and showing people um, these stories that before may not have gotten traction because they would have been killed in some editor's room someplace. But because of the internet and because of, you know, Twitter and Facebook and Reddit and all these other sites, they can spread and they can really get the traction they deserve. But also, I think, too, you know, I think people are listening to the victims of this story more and aren't and are believing what they're saying, yeah. you know, and it has more credence as well it should versus... Um, you know, versus being able to dismiss it out of hand or ignore it, right? Because I think that that's prevalently what's happened and what's been, you know, what has been enabling our society to be able to not, to not have to deal with that stuff, to not have to deal with anything that one isn't profitable and two isn't uh, isn't comfortable or says something about how we treat people. And I think that that's something that I'm glad is changing. And I. I but I'm amazed that it, I mean, it trickles down to everything. And that's, I'm amazed. I don't know why I'm, I'm I don't know why I, I'm amazed and or surprised about it. But I mean, even insofar as like our little podcast and doing the research and, and digging into this stuff and having, and being like, oh man, this guy's a, this guy's a jerk. Yeah, I don't. And probably, I don't, you know, we I shouldn't be talking about him. But to me, it's like, wow, like about the chupacabra. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't For think I can. Sake. I don't think I can re- reiterate enough how stupid the chupacabra is as a cryptid. <gasps> and so the fact that this is you, you can uh, tweet at him, people, not at me. The fact fan. that the fact fan that, of the chupa. The fact that this is the story that really mm-hmm. you know one of these issues came up with. You know, it's yeah. it's kind of it's crazy. It's it's really ridiculous because you don't expect it. it. <laughs> No, and I think that's one of not to make excuses for us because you know I will damn well do that. But like I think that's also why I, we were sort of lax because we're like it's chupacabra. It's not like you know you got to double down for like we're going to be discussing, you know, something highly politicized or something highly you know, you know, heavy charge to it. We're like no, it's probably a dog with mange. But you know, it's like, that's what got us. That's what it's got us. The revenge. El Perro de Sarna. Yeah, yeah, we we didn't we didn't expect it. And, he, and here's the thing too, right? We we should be more vigilant. We should be more careful. We That's um, on us. So if you know if you were offended or if you felt like we weren't taking it seriously enough or anything else like that, we of course apologize so much. Um, yeah, man. As soon as people reached out, we tried to make things right. And that's honestly why you know I I can't I don't think I can say this enough either. If you as a listener hear something on the show that you find objectionable or you think we're uneducated about or maybe we don't. We're not taking the right way or there's another side or whatever. Please reach out to us. You know, yes, yes. I mean, you know, Civilly, we, yes, right. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't I don't want to get any death threats or anything, but, you know, oh, man, no. uh, yeah. I, I'll, I'll take a heated email any day, well, you know, especially think, when it's deserved, like in this case. I think discourse is and making sure we're not working out of an echo chamber is important and it's hard, right, because. You naturally, humans naturally gravitate towards things that reassure them. And a lot of times now that's, you know, whatever your opinion is on any given matter, if it echoes something that you believe you trust and you have a little bit more of a sense of security. So, but we don't want to, we don't want to fall into that trap. And I think that that's something that is awesome about podcasting in general is there's so many different takes and so many different sides to all sorts of different stories. So it's important for us to hear back from people and to make sure that, hey, we're taking a whole host of different opinions and mindsets into consideration. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. But I'm still bringing the fart jokes, people. Still Sorry. bringing the fart jokes. All right. Great Bring stuff. The fart jokes. Okay. Uh, and so, Marie, I think we mm-hmm. can start talking mm-hmm. about the chupacabra. Yes, I think we can. All right. First what? of all, I'm a little disheartened to, to hear that we are anti chupacabra right out of the gate. Last well, time, totally pro chupacabra, people, if you didn't hear it. I'm joking. I was going to say, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, okay. Um, so, <sighs> chupacabra, man, where do I start? Where, where do we start, Marie? Start at the beginning. Start at the origin story of the chupacabra. Okay. So first, I think it's the most interesting part now. It is honestly the most interesting part. For listeners that don't know, the chupacabra is a really stupid cryptid. Oh! It started, it started off as this... Um, Man. It started off as this kind of... Tweeted him, not me. I'm pro. Don't pro at chupacabra. me. Chup- chupacabra's at done. Me. Don't, don't, don't at me. The, the chupacabra started off as this kind of bipedal... Almost like a gray alien, but with, you know, so the eyes, the face shape was similar to that as well with these Humanoid. bony, these bony ridges on its mm-hmm. back. Right. So kind of like um, mm. it looked like Spikes. the alien from Alien, kind of. Yeah. Because it was designed by the guy that designed the alien from Alien. Pretty much. <laughs> but pretty much. The idea there was this this creature had these uh, it was like an alien like creature, some kind of monster looking thing. It was greenish to gray in color. It appeared to maybe have smoothish skin to sometimes it was said to have scales like a reptile Mm. and, um, you know, either glowing red eyes or deep, dark, big eyes, like big almond shaped eyes. Mm. Um, the general tale of the chupacabra is you wake up one morning. It's a beautiful day in Puerto Rico or in, you know, Mexico or in Texas, which is where it started, right? Yeah, It started in Puerto Rico. Yeah. But this is a recent myth. Within like the nineteen, you know, nineteen nineties. Nineteen nineties. This is like a nineteen yeah. nineties myth. Yeah. Yeah. And the creature, you'd wake up and your your animals, your livestock would appear to be dead, with mm-hmm. no apparent traces of blood, and then puncture wounds on their body someplace. And so it would appear mm-hmm. that the only mm-hmm. damage to the creatures that were there was the loss of blood. And so there was no, you know, it, it didn't look like normal predation. There was no, there were tracks maybe and, you know, signs of a, st- a struggle and all that kind of stuff. But there, it wasn't like the, you know, the creatures, your goats or your chickens or whatever mm-hmm. didn't have like a throat ripped out. They, they didn't have any of their meat seem to be eaten or anything. They would just have blood removed. Right. And, and these, these are the marks. stories thereof. Yes. And so... Yes. The local communities would say, well, what the heck is going on here? This looks crazy. And then they were able to pull from a long history of local mythology, of modern mythology in the form of TV and movies. And mm-hmm. this story just kind of ran away. And, and, and frankly, a very an actual real event that was occurring that was misunderstood through this lens and then blew up into the creation of a cryptid. That really, we've, like Marie said earlier, we have seen the Chupacabra story essentially evolve and be created over the last 30 years to 40 years, maybe you can say. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it it is just, it is, it started, It's it, this is a mythology that is started and ended in everyone who's listening's lifetimes. Which is unless amazing to me. Unless you're I, like a toddler listening for some reason in your parents' and car. Which you shouldn't be. You should not be listening to this if you're a toddler. I don't even know if you should be listening to it if you're an adult. That's just my own opinion. I'm joking. It's not clear. <laughs> it's still not very clear to me either, Marie. <laughs> we don't know who's listening to this. But honestly, I mean, if you look at the other sort of cryptid myths that are out there that are American, that are specifically American, we did one on Tahoe Tessie. That's more recent, too. But like uh, Jersey Devil, right? 1800s. So it's got more of like... It has more of the haze of history put over it. And these descriptions are coming from a time when there wasn't, uh, you know, a way to accurately record them besides the written word. Yeah. And all of a sudden you have this, you have this thing that's coming out of nowhere that's, that's completely foreign and it has its own. What's, I think the most interesting thing is it has its own origin to it. It has its own genesis, which is rooted in all sorts of different things. Yeah. It's it's really interesting. Now, the actual name Chupacabra 
it means um, it's translated as goat sucker. And so it means chupar, which means to suck, and cobber, which means goat. Which is awesome. So, yeah, right, yeah. Which is different than uh, different than my nickname in high school, which was um, which was Chupa something Huevo close. or Egg Sucker. <laughs> yeah, something close to that. Um, something close to Goat Sucker. So, <laughs> oh, God. It, it, honestly, it's lucky. Not everybody you've been it is, great. It, it, is, it is lucky for this creature that they went with it, it attacking goats and not chickens, which it was actually most commonly found to attack. Because yeah, then it would have gotten weird. Right? The name would have been weird. Um, anyways, the the original name Chupacabra was coined by Puerto Rican comedian Silverio Perez, which again, to me, missing the whole chicken connection, Silverio Perez, uh, man, you missed the boat, dude. I don't know. Well, and the fact that it was coined by a comedian, too, right? It's like, that's the name that's stuck. That's the name that we have used for it for However long it's been well, out. So he was he was a he was a radio DJ in San Juan at the time of the of the original attacks in ninety five. Right. So that's why it kind of took off, you know what I mean? But all right. But so, so it came from a comedian and not a scientist or not <laughs> farmers or not like you know, a gr- you know, a, a tome a telling scientist. stories of they come up with all sorts of junk, dude. Come all right. Um, you know, I mean that's I the fact that it came up by a comedian. It's interesting. Right there is your first check mark that this could be suspect. So the the original the original account started in March of 1995 in Puerto Rico. All right. That on its own is interesting that it happened so early, right? It's again, it is like Maria said, it is not this sort of what's the word? It's a new cryptid. Mhm. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. the first person to find the chupacabra, or the first person to report it's a, a chupacabra, modern cryptid. It is. The first person to report a chupacabra was Madeline Tolentino. Now, at her initial report, what she said was this thing was bipedal. It appeared to be between something around like three to four feet tall, somewhere around there. It had very big eyes, a slit mouth, small holes on its face that appeared to be for its nose, spines that went down Mm. its back, and then three... Little fingers, or not little, but three fingers, three little fingers, three little fingers that ended in claws. That's so cute. And it had, it had, obviously it had four limbs and it would either walk or it would kind of, um, it would walk, scuttle? but it would also kind of scuttle. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm. right. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. Like you running up the stairs as a kid from the basement. That is the way it walked all the time. Now, she said the way that she described her first meeting with with this thing was it's very strange. She describes almost uh, sneaking up on it is the wrong word. She just she describes getting close enough to the thing that she specifically mentions its genitals. Or why is that? Or Here's my question thereof. with all these with all these cryptids and sort of uh, some of the alien stories that you hear. Why do we, we're going to talk about their genitals. Marie, Out of the you, gate, we're talking about their always, genitals. You always look at the bait and tackle. It's the first thing to look for. I'm just sort of curious. You don't always have a chance. Quality and type of person, but that's the descriptor that they're going to go with, right? I mean, come on. It's like, does it speak? Does it understand me? Is it a sentient being? Does it mean me harm? No, we're going to look at its junk. That's good. All right, keep going. But Show she, me you your tuba huevos. <laughs> All right. So uh, the creature the creature then essentially uh, she startled it because there was a, uh, a lady looking at its junk. It got startled and then it ran away. <laughs> right. And so supposedly what she said was that it it chased her. She got it chased. Uh, it ran away. And then actually a kid in the town chased after it. And tried to get a hold of it, but then, you know, he, he ran away. But supposedly... Which, again, I mean, come on. Like, well, so supposedly... It's this foreign being that's clearly horrific and may or may not have junk, and you're trying to catch it. It may or may not have junk. It doesn't have junk, kill it! So, the creature, the creature supposedly... Uh, and here's the thing, right? Mrs. Tolentino's recounting of the creature... It's not super great. It's it's it kind of wavers between. So, not that's her, super her, and then not great. Her, her initial report <laughs> is this bipedal creature that mm-hmm. seems to kind of walk. She says it kind of hops sometimes. You know, it, when it ran, it mm-hmm. hopped away almost like a kangaroo, mm. and that um, 
But later on, when the kid came and said, no, I chased it, I chased it, he said it appeared to float, almost like it was suspended uh, in the air. It floated. Yeah. All right. So <sighs> the next time, the next time, though, that she was interviewed, she changed her story. What? And her story will change significantly over time as well, which is what may, leads me to think that the Chupacabra is a stupid made up story. Well, now, but, she okay, said, but just just step back a little bit. If a lot of times when people witness something, their stories do change, right? I mean, even all the cop shows that I've ever watched say that that's a normal thing, right? That, that doesn't, that's not inherently something that means somebody is lying. They, an, they anticipate there will be some fluctuation in this story. But well, I mean, I think that this probably puts the stress test on that theory pretty well. No, yeah, absolutely, right? And so she would later then say that actually the creature was shorter, around two to three feet tall, that it had... Um, it had less or, or you know less reptilian kind of features that it had five fingers on its hands, not the three with the big claws and things. And then she would she would go off and on saying that there was a slime that the creature left after it sucked the goats or after it sucked the blood or whatever. Yeah, what's with the slime? I don't know. The th- Does it have to be slimy? Well, so the funny thing with the slime is that it's, the funny thing with the slime is that the, the she would later say too that she had contacted Linda Moulton Howe. Ah. Who, if you have watched the Ancient Aliens show, Linda Which Moulton Howe, genius. Linda Moulton Howe is the is the lady that gets on and makes Giorgio say, "What the hell is she talking about?" You know, she's the one that comes down and is like, "He was an angel." He's, you know, she's she's out there, right? <laughs> she started her career as a relatively serious journalist, um, investigating cattle mutilations, and since mm-hmm. then, like the UFO subject does to a lot of people. It kind of it stopped going from cattle mutilations to the aliens are stealing our cows to turn them into a cow stew to feed their <laughs> alien human hybrid children. But that's for another episode. As you do. But either way, if you find slime, you call Linda Moulton Howe. I guess we should have that T-shirt made out of that. She's the slime person, or not really the slime person. If if you find a corpse that's missing organs and you can't explain it, call Linda Moulton Howe. If that's there's an LMH. Slime, that's just a that's it's an LMH. Just a, the bonus. Okay. Linda Moulton Howe would say, this lady never contacted me. <laughs> I have no idea what the slime could possibly be. So dodged a bullet on this one, which is good good on her. Yeah. Well, later on it would come out that Mrs. Tolentino had before the initial sighting seen a movie, Marie. A movie? Now, was it a Charlie Brown feature? It was not. It was not a Charlie Brown feature. In fact, this was a uh, this was a Natasha Henstridge uh, vehicle what? called Species. I wonder what she's up to these days. Now, Species evidently she's harassing livestock. <laughs> species has a forty four percent on Rotten Tomatoes, which is not that bad. With a thirty one percent audience score. Now, this is one of the few movies that I've ever seen on Rotten Tomatoes where the audience score is lower than the tomato score. Yeah. Usually, you know, it's like it's like uh, mm-hmm. the Fast mm-hmm. and the Furious mm-hmm. 27, you know, haircut yeah. style. And it's, you know, the, the that- tomato meter's giving it a 12 and people are like, 85, Vin Diesel's badass. Well, it's, it's this is badass. not that yeah, kind of no, movie. No, no. So it was universally planned, which is kind of, yeah, which no, I do remember seeing it and remember thinking, well. So yeah. here's here's it has uh, it has Ben K- it has Gandhi in it. It does it does it has uh, what's his face Ben Kingsley man Ben, ben Kingsley is a great actor he's uh, a genius actor and um yeah maybe not is, so much in this this is the review from uh, Ron Tomatoes a quote hmm. Species shows flashes of the potential to blend exploitation and sci-fi horror in ingenious oh, ways my favorite too. But is ultimately mainly interested in flashing star Natesh, Natasha Henstridge's skin. End Ooh. quote. If you Google uh, Sill from Species, <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's 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 uh, it's the Chupacabra. Well, and it's, <laughs> it was created by a very famous Swedish artist, right? Who designed I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head, but designed the Alien. Right? Uh, Geiger. Geiger, right. Geiger's yeah. got a very, very distinct style and yeah. has been utilized 
in a lot of kind of creepy, creepy stuff. And again, kind of slimy, creepy. There's a whole section of his stuff. It's erotica, kind of wacky noodleness. Well, what's, and yeah, what's interesting with still, yeah. what's interesting with still is that it, it seems to have the kind of nineties, late nineties mm-hmm. obsession with putting, mm-hmm. uh, putting the nipple spots on armor. Yes. You know, like in Batman and Robin. Oh my God. Right. God love the nineties for that man. George Clooney could cut through a pane of glass with those damn things. Right. It's, uh, it's, it's Can you imagine obvious. the production meeting where they decided that was a go? And that person now, I mean, I'd like to think that they're like living in in solitude somewhere, just reflecting on their lives. But they're probably like huge in Hollywood right now. No, we got like a we, bullet point on their resume that they talk to when they go out for you know sushi. Yeah, got, the the nipples on the suit, totally mine. Genius, Marie. If we don't hmm. put the nipples on the suit, then where does Robin know? Then how does Robin know where to kiss? That's uh, true. All right, so. It's here's the thing, right? And this the the theory that has become the most popular in the skeptical community is the idea that the chupacabra is a misremembering of this creature still from species. Now, why do we say that? Because Mrs. Tolentino would later say that when she did see the movie, she would later say that she saw it later, that she was taken aback, essentially, by how closely the story and the creature resembled the real Chupacabra event. And that now, she... Interesting, because you want to, like, go back and, and find out when she did see it, right? Because we're saying that she saw it before, like, but we don't have a source for that. No primary source that actually has any kind of, like, yes... She definitely saw it before. We're hearing that she saw it before. We're reading about that. She she saw it before she saw this thing. Well, yeah, so we don't, yeah, again, we don't know 100%. And again, it could, it could be one of those cases where, you know, maybe she saw the movie after the event and then it was reported or vice versa or whatever, right? But either way, mm-hmm. the description of her creature and the way that she came to believe the creature was created it's like a one-to-one match to this creature, right? So the, the, the movie essentially says that it's 1999, Puerto Rico. They get a uh, – the SETI program gets a transmission from an alien civilization or whatever um, that says that they want to uh, – what's the word? They're going to splice their DNA with human DNA to create a creature, and that creature is still. And so then the creature oh, escapes. Too. The creature escapes. <laughs> And starts um, terrorizing. Starts terrorizing, terrorizing the local community, essentially. Havoc. Yeah. Havoc. And sometimes she's, you know, she's foxy and, you know, wearing hardly any clothes and just sort of getting by on whatever. And then other times she's like this full on Geiger alien. Yeah. So the other thing is that the original encounter occurred a month after the movie went into theaters. Mm, and at okay. the time, she said that she had seen the movie. Into, okay, so there's our primary source. All yeah, right. so it's not, you know, this is not just a uh, silly you know, theory or whatever. It's probably true. But here's the thing. Hmm. She wasn't the only person to report a Chupacabra sighting. Because See? once... We're once going she, pro Chupacabra on this. Once she, once she made that first story, mm-hmm. once, she, once she put out that first... Um, I don't want to say story, but... Once she had that first sighting, sighting. Yeah, yeah, once she had that first sighting, people started to try to find other, or uh, people started to see these things essentially around the world. And I mean, around the, the is the, around the world is the wrong way of saying it, I guess, really. It was in very specific pockets of, like, the, the Southwest United States, um, you know, S- uh, S- uh, South America generally, South and Central America, and then, you know, Puerto Rico were the main hotspots of where this thing was seen. So the original signing of Madeline Tolentino was in uh, Canovanas, right, which is a pretty small mm-hmm. town, but where 150 animals were killed. There was then a similar account, supposedly from 1975, in the town of Mocha, that was that was attributed to a creature called El Vampiro del Mocha, or the Vampire of Mocha, De Mocha, not Del Mocha. I'm learning Italian in my spare time, Marie, so sue me. Um, <laughs> At that point, originally, the, the Mocha case was thought to be caused by a satanic cult. But then it's, Ooh. but then, you know, um, after that kind of, you know, died down and whatever, and the Chupacabra came out, people were like, that seems more likely. 
what so, it does. <laughs> you know. All right. So the the creatures are when after this point, farm animals. Anytime a farm animal would be found dead through no apparent mauling or you know, just a, a creature would be a thing would be found dead in the fields or whatever. And then people would say, well, maybe it's the chupacabra, especially if it was in countries like the Dominican Republic, right? Colombia, Honduras, um, Peru, Brazil, Mexico, and the southern United States. So why there? Like, why, why, why is the sighting, do you think, localized to that? Area? So I think that there's a couple of different reasons. The first reason is that these cultures are primed through their cultural history for a creature like this. Now, we've talked a lot. We, we, have a, we had a series on vampires, right? We talked about that idea and how it was common throughout the Western world. But we also hinted at, in that episode that there were other versions of the vampire in other cultures, right? We talked about how, you know, in China, there was the creature that would essentially, uh, what was it, like, it would eat your penis, and then if you if it got all of it in, you would die or something. It's I don't know if it was China or Japan, hmm. but yeah, I and don't there was remember a, any of that. Well, there was <laughs> I think this was before you came on the show. <laughs> Back when we were doing a lot of genital based episodes. And again, <laughs> should have done my research better. Yeah, really, I don't know. What should have listened doing. to the show. I, it was many years ago to see what the topics were. I don't know what had you're doing. I, had I known that, I I might have been like, might have given me some pause. So the other, uh, the other, the other version of this type of creature, though, was a fat stealer, or, a, or st someone who would steal other bodily fluids that appeared to be important to different cultures. So again, um, there was you know succubus and incubus. Obviously, were stealing um, you know a certain type of of fluid or life force or whatever. There were vampires who were stealing blood, which was thought to be the source of your power or your energy, right? But in, in Southern America and in kind of places like, say, Puerto Rico, um, those countries, for them, the vital fluid of the body was fat. Mm -hmm. That was the thing that these creatures were trying to steal. Huh. Now, this really became... We can see the most evidence of this in stories of, of different creatures throughout those regions. So, for instance, one of them is known as the uh, Likachiri or Fat Stealer, right? So the Likachiri was said to live in the Andean Highlands, and what it would do is it would, as people were sleeping, it would drain them of fat. And so the fat would then, um, and this thing would either be like a like a, a a monstrous demon or even just like a person dressed, you know, a, a person you've never met who comes into town and suddenly people die in the night. They wake up and they seem to have no they seem to have no body fat left. And then the person leaves. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what we can think about is just like with the vampire. Right. In the case of the vampire, the thing that people were dying from or we think they were dying from at least was tuberculosis where they would become pale. Um, they would be coughing up blood. They would have these, you know, it's like a wasting disease. Right. In the same case here, there's a wasting disease as well, but you can imagine that if someone wastes over a long period of time, what do they lose? They also lose fat, right? They lose muscle content. They'll begin to start looking like, like mummies almost, like walking mummies. And especially in a cold climate like, say, the Indian Highlands, where if someone dies, you might not find them for months, right, depending on where they are. You can imagine that you might come upon, you might come upon a corpse that appears to have been desiccated essentially, but preserved in the snow or in the cold um, that appears to have lost all of its fat. Mm -hmm. So for me, the idea of these creatures, it, you know, again, and part of that is sort of a anthropological, you know, just so story that I'm telling right now, but I, I, I don't know. I can see the logic behind that idea, right? Well, yeah, that that's, but that's the critical thing that would be affected would be the person's, not just like the blood, because that's sort of more, again, more like European vampire, but the sustenance that's keeping that person alive is being taken from them. Absolutely. Yeah. And so these kinds of stories even occur in the modern day. And it's kind of it's, it's taken on an interesting sort of turn today where. When the Spanish first landed in the New World. 
there were stories initially that they were uh, Likichiri. They were these kind of vampiric fat stu- fat suckers who they weren't coming to, you know, they weren't coming to Central and South America for their gold. They weren't there to steal their riches or their land. What they were looking for were young bodies that they could suck energy from in the form of fat, in the form of organs, in the form of whatever, to then bring back to their queen. Which makes sense. They're basically going to steal their lives. Yes, What makes absolutely. them well, yeah. Yeah. And so the other idea that's now become, even in the modern day, part of the mythology of these regions is the idea of forced organ donation, right? You know, you're in a town, you want to cross the border, you want to cross and make some money, you want to, you just need, you're in need of a quick buck, right? And so you meet some guy in a hotel room and he tells you, I know, you know, I know a couple up in America that'll pay you $10,000 for your kidney. We'll do the surgery in a, in a hospital. It'll be nice and clean. We'll get it figured out, whatever. The next thing you know, you wake up in a bathtub full of ice, bleeding to death. <sighs> right? That was my entire junior year of college. <laughs> it's ridiculous, right? It took you so long to get those kidneys back. That That is a real, it's a real fear, you know? This idea, Mm -hmm. again, of these people coming and stealing organs or stealing, even stealing fat, that's still a story today, right? Where people say, you know, there are, there are, um, there was a group of tourists from, I think from France who started a riot or or they didn't start the riot, but a riot started because people thought that they were there to steal the fat of locals. Hmm. So it's an extremely interesting kind of theory or idea, but it's also not one that is, it's honestly not one that is all that far off from the way that their country has been treated as well. So right. you have this idea of there's this cultural norm in their, in their societies where these things come, they steal your, your fat, they steal your vital fluids, whatever, they then leave. But then there's also the very real idea that's part of the Chupacabra story as well, which is the government, a, a more powerful government, the U.S. government – is using our land to do experiments. And those experiments, if they go wrong, are going to hurt the people of Puerto Rico or wherever. Yes. And so in Puerto Rico, especially since it is a United States colony, um, it's, it's especially prevalent that kind of thinking or that fear. And for good reason in some cases. Well, yeah, I mean, again, that's, I would look at it as it's a post-colonial view on on the cryptids, right? It's they something is coming in, and this goes all the way back historically. Like you said, the conquistadors come in, they take everything, they basically debilitize the land, they leave, right? They take everything that was worth anything out of the country and impoverish the people, and that's that's like the classic sort of the classic identity of of colonialism yes. right that, and this this thing is a monster this thing is a beast without any kind of moral compass which is colonialism and i think it's interesting that where it spawned and came to roost even within a pop culture reference is uh puerto rico right and that's the that is probably the ripest place for something like this to grow now this is especially powerful in Puerto Rico because of their history of really, really bad treatment by the United States government. Yeah. So this is a story from 2016 from the Atlantic, Puerto Rico's invisible health crisis. And so I'm going to uh, just read a quote here from this. So quote, for over 60 years, the U S Navy used the small Island of Vieques, Puerto Rico as a bombing range and site for military training exercises. Then the Island got sick. Thousands of residents have alleged that the military's activities caused illnesses. With a population around 9,000, Vieques is home to some of the highest sickness rates in the Caribbean. According to Cruz Maria Nazario, an epidemiologist at the University of Puerto Rico's Graduate School of Public Health, people who live in Vieques are eight times more likely to die of cardiovascular disease and seven times more likely to die of diabetes than others in Puerto Rico, where the prevalence of those diseases rivals U.S. rates. Cancer rates on the island are higher than those in any other Puerto Rican municipality. The Navy eventually conceded to using heavy metals and toxic chemicals 
like depleted uranium age in orange on the island, but denied any link between their presence and the health conditions of the people who live there. To this day, it is unclear what exactly caused the current conditions in Vieques. It's a health crisis with a cause that's almost impossible to prove. The government requires a particular standard of causal evidence before it will administer relief. Yet independent groups cannot necessarily provide that proof because the federal government still owns the land previously occupied by the military and controls access to it. End quote. So the idea that the United States government is doing these kinds of secret tests on Puerto Rico and that because of those tests, something is on the loose that the government doesn't want them to know about. That's not that far fetched in Puerto Rico. No. You know, when it comes no. to like Denver airport, it's a little bit harder to swallow. Bad. But you know, Bad. when you're, when you're part, when you're in a town where you are getting cancer because the government sprayed agent orange there 40 years ago, and they only recently, because of fighting with the government, they only recently admitted that they've done that. It's a little harder to see the connection between the two things. Yeah, well, and I think you could, you just have to go as far back as Hurricane Maria to understand yeah. why their trust level is where it is with the American government. I mean, it's it's exactly where it's exactly where I would assume anyone's would be if you they, if they were in that environment if that that was what their experience was, and I think that that's it's interesting that again like. I am curious if this, if the Chupacabra myth doesn't come back up within that area in a certain period of time, because it's, again, it's, to me, it's, it's sort of like the natural reaction storytelling wise to something like this event. Well, so, you know, it's interesting because a lot of the ideas of the Chupacabra or a lot of the theories around it Mm -hmm. have sort of morphed back into the UFO world. They've kind of gotten folded (sighs) back in. Uh, so it's kind of a funny thing. All right, we're going to we're going to get into it a little bit more here as we get deeper into the into the history. Now, the after those first that first rash of sightings in 95, mm-hmm. like we said, it spread. And the reasons that we think it spread, at least, are those cultural reasons we just talked about. It spread first to uh, Mexico. There was a big sighting in Jalisco. Where uh, actually, so and the cool thing about these studies or these these cases that happen in, say, Mexico, is that the Mexican government actually sent a team of scientific investigators. Um, and what they found every single time were wild dogs with mange. Ah. Boo. Now, so actually, this is a quote. This is a quote from the, a 1996 report that uh, was quoted in Skeptical Inquirer. So, quote, I don't know about the rest of Mexico or the rest of the world. But here, the goat suckers are just dogs. There is this huge psychosis. You see it everywhere. End quote. So what they were saying or what the theory was, and again, every, so every single time that there has been a body, every time there has been, you know, you know remains, uh, droppings, anything, the DNA always says it's a dog. Every single time. That's what the government wants you to think. It is not. It doesn't even, unless every single government in the world is working together, um... <laughs> it's a dog. It's a dog. Oh uh-huh, yeah, I know. They got them in. De- they got them in the basement of that airport, Marie. That's At where him. they got them. At Chris, I'm totally with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the team in Mexico City, they again, like I said, investigated every single time they found that it was a dog, and so their explanation essentially was when an animal is so sick and has such a terrible case of mange, especially a dog, that it starts to go looking for. Um, for animals inside of enclosures and pens and things, as opposed to hunting them in the wild, the animal is going for the weakest, the easiest way for it to get nutrition. And so their argument is that the animal will essentially eat, you know, kill the animal, but then not have enough strength to actually rip into it or or eat the the flesh. And so instead will lap up the blood. Which makes sense. Can you imagine having to be the poor people that have to run these tests every single time it comes up? They're like, oh, was it? Okay, so you saw it attack the livestock. Okay, no, I'm taking notes. I'm listening. I'm listening. And then have to go back and be like, dog with mange. Dog with mange. So here's the other thing too, right? Dog with mange. When they when they find these creatures as well, right, they are, you know, quote unquote, drained of blood. What often mm-hmm. happens as well with a corpse, and we talked about this with vampires too, is that blood pools at the lowest point. 
So, yeah, they're not going to find necessarily because of, of gravity, right? Blood is only circulating through your body because your heart is pumping. it. If your yes. heart stopped, if you were to, to die, blood would stop flowing and it would start to pool in the lowest points in your body. And so really, you know, and you ha- I mean, you have a lot of blood, but it's not like you have a, you know, it's not like pools of blood are inside your body, you know? If, if you were to lose all your blood, it would not take very long for it to either, you know, evaporate and appear as a stain or just to pool in your legs or your, you know, your gut or wherever. Yeah, your lowest extremity. And right. again, we don't have any, even though this has all been reported, there's no, you know, there's no double blind study on the fact that this is occurring. No, there's, ne- there's never been a necropsy in these cases, right? It's, yeah. it's always just, it's always just the chupacabra it's- got them. You know, drained of blood. Right. And it's the same thing with cattle mutilations with UFO cases. You know, it's people that again, it's a really frust. It's a frustration that I have, at least couldn't tell. I just ah, I I try (laughs) to live my life by the idea that Socrates gave, which was, you know, he's only the, the, the smartest man in Athens or the wisest man in Athens because he knows for a fact that he knows nothing. Mm-hmm. Right. I try mm-hmm. my best to do that. My wife would say I do a very poor job of it, <laughs> but I try my best in a lot of these cases where, you know, these people find their animals killed. Mm-hmm. They all say in one breath, well, I've never seen anything like this and then say, well, I know enough about the situation to say that there's nothing that natural could have caused this. But it's like you just said you never saw it before. How how can you know that? You know, right. I, I like to think that I know a lot about chemicals. If, uh, you know, if even even chemicals I know a lot about, right? But if there's a, a, a huge accident or something that I've never seen before, I know enough to say, I don't know what's going on. I might have the tools to pick it apart with the right amount of information, but right at the get-go, like, what the hell do I know? Right. So it's really frustrating to read these stories and have people, you know, well, this guy's been on the ranch for 50 years of his life. Okay. And he said he never, he's never seen anything like this before. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's like the, you know, your horse well, gets sick and you decide, well, your right. horse gets sick and you decide not to call a vet because you've known this horse its entire life. Right. Well, you have been trained to deal with this situation, dude. I don't care how well you know the horse or you know the animals or you've been around them for so long. <sighs> If your horse is sick, you should probably call someone who knows more about it than you do. And it's well, the same yeah. thing in these situations. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. whatever. Yeah. Drives me crazy. The other thing well, that I think no. people I think expect... that's true, but it's also statistics, right? I mean, like, you... It, the same thing applies to any kind of situation yeah. where you're taking yourself out of a subjective, which is, I've never seen this, ergo it doesn't exist, and I've seen everything. Yeah. Versus what is statistically possible and valid. Right, absolutely. Again, it's just how are you challenging what you think you already know? If you're not, then yeah, you have seen everything, and it is a chupacabra. Yeah, and you know what? I'll give you the perfect example of this. Marie, have you ever listened to Car hmm. Talk? I have. I love Car Talk. Okay, those guys know more about cars and know more about, frankly, everything as far as I can tell than anyone Kinda. I have ever heard of or met or listened to on, in any form. Yes. And they still have, and I mean, of course, the show has been gone for some time, but they still do reruns and whatever, but... Every single episode, there's someone that calls in and they say, I don't know what the heck that is. It's Stump the Chumps. They, exactly. They always stump, stump the, the chumps, chumps yeah. right? They, they stump always the stump the yeah. chumps. So yeah. it's the same kind of thing with these cases. Just because you have a lot of experience with something doesn't mean you have experience with everything around that one thing. No. That's why you shouldn't. Exactly. Okay. The other thing that I, th- the other part of this that I think is Got really that interesting. that settled. Yeah. The That's- other thing I think is interesting with these cases is. I think when people when people in their minds think of a dog attack or they think of an animal mm-hmm. killing another animal, they expect it to be like a bloodbath. Yeah, it's more of a fury, yeah. Yeah, like they, you know, they're not thinking, I mean, even if you watch nature documentaries, if you watch mm-hmm. a cheetah take out a gazelle, mm-hmm. the cheetah mm-hmm. bites the gazelle's neck and then the gazelle dies. Right. And then, yeah, the cheetah will eat the meat from the gazelle, but there's, you know... It's not like there's a crazy amount of blood there even. Even after it's eaten, there's maybe a couple of splotches of blood on the ground and the body's just gone. You know, the animals Or they put it, it in a tree. Exactly. That's my so other favorite thing they do. It's to me it's it's another one of these things where your expectations have gotten the better of you and so you expect, you know, I don't know, you basically expect this goat got 
you know, the same blood stain as if a giant leg came down and just squished it. And so there's just blood everywhere versus, you know, a predator did a precision kill on it and then took what it wanted. Yes. All right. So that's the first, the first rash of Chupacabra sightings. It was all dogs. Mm hmm. Now, Marie, mm. I want you to guess. You got three guesses. Mm. The second rash of sightings, what do you think it was? Where is it? Is this, Are we still in uh, Puerto Rico? No, we're, go, we're this... going to America. We're going to America? Ooh, man. What was it really, or what did we see? Or what did we think it was? <laughs> what, what do you think it is? Well, I still, you know, I still, there is like this tiny little part of my brain that's just holding out that hope for that chupacabra, even though I think it was dogs with mange. Again, cats with mange? Chickens with mange. Dogs with mange, Marie. Oh, come on. All right. So, I guess, it, you know, again, like, whatever is the most probable answer is probably, you know, it's probably right. So and it was th- dogs with mange before. Probably it's still dogs with mange. Here's the thing. <sighs> the next the next rash of sightings occurred in the United mm-hmm. States, in the southwest United States, and then in upper, like, northern Mexico. And these are the cases where you might have seen on, like, Monster uh, Monster Quest or whatever, mm-hmm, where mm-hmm, they actually mm-hmm. have a body, supposedly, or there's yes. the blue dog case. In all of those cases, again, it is uh, their dogs. <laughs> and it's not the government wanting you to believe that they're dogs. They're actually dogs, right? I mean, that's the thing. I just, uh, they're just dogs with me. Yeah. And so in these cases, too, we even have bodies. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's all kinds of studies that have occurred, and they're, yeah. they're, it's, it's mange every single freaking time. There is no chupacabras. Unfortunately, it kind of sucks. The most famous of these cases, or the most famous, um, what's the word? The most k- famous ones of these uh, chupacabras is the one from Jerry Ayer, which mm-hmm. is, um, that's the blue dog chupacabra. It is, if you just look at it, it's just a skinny dog with mange. Again, and then there's another one, too, that was done by... Um, a uh, woman, Phyllis Canyon, who uh, she was the one that was on a TV show, right? They did a they did a DNA test and they did a, they read the DNA tests on air and they were like, it's a dog. <laughs> and, and she looked upset. Um, well, of course. Like, uh. yeah. So this is a quote from her. This is a quote from Canyon. Quote, I'm like, no, I don't believe that it's a coyote. I've got some kind of canine in it, but it is not all coyote. I asked for the DNA results and I looked at it. I'm a naturopathic doctor, and I practice with a group of doctors, and we all looked at the DNA and unanimously agreed that there was no way it was close to being an exact match, end quote. Yeah, so they took it to the Mayo Clinic, right? They took it to Stanford. They took it to John Hopkins, uh, and then they finished with with Yale, right? And so they, they took it to every single pathologist out there and veterinarian school out there, and there's actually huge scientific papers about how that initial reading got it wrong. You can look it up in scientific. No, there's not, because you know why? <laughs> this is a dog with mange. Another dog with mange, man, and uh. she took it to her doctors. That's what I love about that. She's a homeopath. She's a naturopath, yeah, a I know. Naturopath. She, um... What's different? What's, yeah. So basically, it's like, again, like, you don't like what you hear, that's okay. You're not going to like everything that comes back to you that you have your heart set on it being something else, right? I mean, that's okay. You have to, especially when it comes down to, like, scientific fact, you know? Well, it's just this not, yeah. Genetic makeup says it's a dog. It doesn't mean it's a new hybrid of dog that just came out now and just attacked your chickens. It's actually just a dog. Or so, coyote. All right. Holy smokes. Now, here's here's... Now my blood pressure is just boiling right now. It's like, ah, oh, peeps. It doesn't, why do you need it? The thing I would ask people, like, why do you want it so badly to be something else? It's okay. I mean, what is, what is in your life that you need that thing so badly to be something else? That's the question. All right. I don't know. I don't know. All right, I'm coming down. I'm coming down. All right. Woo, um, shaking so it So here's, here's a little quote, too. So the final, I think, nail in the coffin is, just how much blood would the chupacabra need to suck for it to be alive? Uh, yes. Right? And so this actually comes from the write-up of this episode that our uh, great researcher Brian Gonkis did for us here. And, nice uh, work, thank Brian. You, thank this you, Brian. Good. And uh, everyone else that helps us with the show. Thank yes. you so much. You guys are killing it. Hoping pretty soon here to have a couple of them on as guest hosts. Uh, we're going to see. It's all right. 
Here's this quote from Brian. So, quote, it must be noted that vampirism in the animal kingdom is quite different than the reports of Chupacabra. Hmm. First, they never intentionally kill their prey to feed. They are always looking for blood near the surface of the prey and never actually puncture something like an artery. Hmm. Vampire bats are the only known mammals that exist solely on blood for their nutrient needs. They have extremely specialized digestive tracts to be able to perform the feat of acquiring 100% of their nutrients from blood, which includes hmm. drinking blood and then expelling the water off in a quick manner as to be able to drink enough blood to obtain necessary nutrients. Typically, a vampire bat will begin urinating two minutes into a feeding in order to consume enough blood to satisfy its needs. Now, this leads an interesting question, Marie, okay? <laughs> if the chupacabra yeah. is real, <laughs> where's the pee? It doesn't have genitalia. It doesn't you wouldn't pee. You wouldn't necessarily see a giant thing Osmosis. of blood, but you might see urine Osmosis. everywhere. Osmosis. All right, and, uh, here again, okay. A normal vampire bat weighs around 40 grams, just under 1.5 ounces. Oh, and in each so feeding, tiny. it consumes half its body weight in blood. That would mean even a small chupacabra the size of a dog, having a specialized digestive system, would have to eat upwards of 20 pounds of blood per feeding to survive. In a creature the size of a dog, the whole hematophagy thing wouldn't work. Bill Schutt, American Museum of Natural History in New York, says, quote, Real world blood, real world blood feeders are looking for blood that's close to the surface of the skin. Um, a creature huh. the size of a dog would starve to death pretty quickly on a blood meal, owing to the lack of essential components such as fat. End quote. Would be a, being a homeopath or a natural path help that at all? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe you can get your fat from a crystal or something. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, um, that's it for the, that's it for the, the that's it for the chupacabra. Oh, you know, Chupacabra. We it, barely uh, knew ye. We barely knew ye. It was an interesting, uh, it's an interesting case. You know, it's fun. It's fun. It's fresh. It's good stuff. We, uh, we liked it a lot when it was, it's, when it was still around. It was, it's interesting again, because it's a newer, it's a newer myth, right? So yeah. you have bodies, you are able to prove or disprove things. Imagine all of the things in the past that are now huge legends that, could or could not be substantiated with modern science. Yeah, it's um, saying. Don't mean to be a spoiler for all this stuff. I'm just saying. Well, what I what I kind of wonder is actually I really like your. What's the word? I really liked your song about the chupacabra. <laughs> no, no, I, I like I like your Chupa question. Chupacabra. Chupacabra. I liked your question before about hmm. will we get another version of this story that comes up in the modern day. I would hope because, so. We because, have to of some uh, nature. Well, I would think I would think we probably will, but I wonder if it's not. You know, one theory that's actually been floating around mm -hmm. on the internet nowadays mm -hmm. is the idea that there are UFOs that are going to Puerto Rico and places like that and killing people. <sighs> yeah. And so I wonder if that isn't part of this frenzy that still hasn't. You know, I wonder if what's her what's her face. Uh, uh, Talentio or whatever, yeah. <laughs> whatever her last name was. I wonder if she hasn't, you know, binge watched the X Files and she started up a new Ooh. thing. <laughs> you know, oh, they're coming for us. Anyways, or maybe you know, maybe Natasha, whatever her name is, can do you know a species two, like an or three. I'm sure there was a second <gasps> one. There was definitely right? a second one. Maybe something direct to direct Netflix. Yeah, we could put our best Amazon? actors in it, like Dolph Lundgren. Oh uh, man, you know he's a Rhodes Scholar. Dude, Dolph Lundgren's the man. He's a Rose Clark. I mean, he's he like, I, I think we should go even, I think we should go bigger and maybe Seagal. Ah, uh, I don't know. Seagal. Seagal I know, not, he's, he might be out of our price range. Is Seagal not dead? <laughs> no, he is. That's why he's so awesome. He's like this undead. <laughs> We're going to CGI him in. All right. Thank you, listeners, for listening to the Mad Scientist <laughs> Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Cox, with my co-host, Marie Mayhew. Chupacabra. Thank yeah. you, as always. We will be back next week with another episode. Um, we're releasing a special bonus on Game of Thrones! Ooh! Spoiler alert! Yeah, big spoiler alert. Thank you again, dear listeners, for listening to the Mad Scientist Podcast. I have been your host, Chris Cogswell, joined by my co-host... Marie Mayhew. If you'd like to contact the show, please send us an email at themadscientistpodcast at gmail.com. That's all one word. You can also follow us on Twitter at Mad Scientist Pod or at Team Giant Squid for Marie. And of course, you can see us on Facebook, on Instagram, and all over the internet as the Mad Scientist Podcast. And again, our logo is the one with the pumpkin head. 
so it's easy to see. Mm-hmm. If you've enjoyed the show tonight, please consider supporting us on Patreon, where the money that you give to us will help us to promote this show further, to make it better, and just to spend more time making it. Because we love doing that. We do love doing that. Our logo was designed by Carrie Shaheen. Our web design is done by Desdemona Howard. Woohoo! And our sound design is done by Jake Cardinal. Thanks again for listening. <laughs> Thank you. This has been a Damn It Chippy production.